Is there some insight into the human brain that explains um, why we don't seem to remember anything from the first few years of life? Yeah, yeah. In fact, actually, I was just talking to my uh, really good friend and colleague, Simona Getty, who studies uh, the neuroscience of child development. And so we were talking about this. And so there are a bunch of reasons, I would say. So one reason is, is there's an area of the brain in the, called the hippocampus, which is very, very important for remembering events or episodic memory. And so the first two years of life, there's a period called infantile amnesia. And then the next couple of years of life after that, there's a period called childhood amnesia. And the difference is, is that basically in the lab and you know even during childhood and afterwards, children basically don't have any episodic memories for those first two years. The next two years, it's very fragmentary, and that's why they call it childhood amnesia. So there's some, but it's not much. So one reason is that the hippocampus is taking some time to develop, but another is the neocortex, so the whole folded stuff of gray matter all around the hippocampus is developing so rapidly and changing. And a child's knowledge of the world is just massively being built up, right? So, I mean, I'm going to probably embarrass myself, but it's like if you showed like, you know, you trained a neural network and you give it like the first couple of patterns or something like that, and then you bombard it with another like, you know, year's worth of data, try to get back those first couple of patterns, right? It's like everything changes. And so the brain is so plastic, the cortex is so plastic during that time. And we think that memories for events are very distributed across the brain. So imagine you're trying to get back that pattern of activity that happened during this one moment, but the roads that you would take to get there have been completely rerouted, right? So I think that's my best explanation. The third explanation is a child's sense of self takes a while to develop. And so their experience of learning might be more learning what happened as opposed to having this first person experience of, oh, I remember I was there. Well, I think somebody uh, once said to me that uh, kind of loosely, philosophically, that the reason we don't remember the first few years of life, infantile amnesia, is because how traumatic it is. Mm -hmm. Basically, the, the error rate that you mentioned when your brain's prediction doesn't match reality, the error rate in the first few years of life, your first few months certainly, is probably crazy high. It's just nonstop mm -hmm. freaking out. The The collision between your model of the world and how the world works is just so high that you want whatever the trauma of that is not to linger around. I always thought that's an interesting idea because like, just imagine the insanity of what's happening in a human brain in the first couple of years. Just, you, you you don't know anything. And there's just this stream of knowledge and we're somehow, given how plastic everything is, it just kind of molds and figures it out. But it's, it's like an insane waterfall of information. I wouldn't necessarily describe it as a trauma. And we can get into this whole stages of life thing, which I just love. And basically, those first few years, there are, I mean, you know, I mean, think about it, a kid's internal model of their body is changing, right? It's like just learning to move. I mean, like, you know, you've, if you ever have a baby, you'll know that like the first three months they're discovering their toes, right? It's just nuts. So everything is changing. But what's really fascinating is, and I think this is one of those, this is not at all me being a scientist, but it's like one of those things that people talk about when they talk about the you know positive aspects of children is that they're exceptionally curious and they have this kind of openness towards the world. And so that prediction error is not a, a negative traumatic thing. I think it's like a very positive thing because it's what they use, they're seeking information. One of the areas that I'm very interested in is the prefrontal cortex. It's an area of the brain that, I mean, I could talk all day about it, but it's it helps us use our knowledge to say, hey, this is what I want to do now. This is my goal. So this is how I'm going to achieve it and focus everything towards that goal, right? The prefrontal cortex takes forever to develop in humans. The connections are still being tweaked and reformed like into late adolescence, early adulthood, which is when you tend to see mental illness pop up, right? So it's being massively reformed. Then you have about 
10 years maybe of prime functioning of the prefrontal cortex. And then it starts going down again and you end up being older and you start losing all that frontal function. So I look at this and you'd say, okay, from you sit around episodic memory talks, we'll always say children are worse than adults at episodic memory. Older adults are worse than young adults at episodic memory. And I always say, would say, God, this is so weird. Why would we have this period of time that's so short when we're perfect, right? Or optimal. And I, I like to use that word optimal now because there's such a culture of optimization right now. And it's like, I realized I have to redefine what optimal is because for most of the human condition, I think we had a series of stages of life where you have basically adults saying, okay, young adults saying, I've got a child and you know I'm part of this village and I have to hunt and forage and get things done. I need a prefrontal cortex so I can stay focused on the big picture and long haul goals. Now I'm a child, I'm in this village, I'm kind of wandering around and I've got some safety and I need to learn about this culture because I know so little. What's the best way to do that? Let's explore. I don't want to be constrained by goals as much. I want to really be free, play and explore and learn. So you don't want a super tight prefrontal cortex. You don't even know what the goals should be yet, right? It's like if you're trying to design a model that's based on a bad goal, it's gonna, it's not going to work well, right? So then you go late in life and you say, well, why don't you have a great prefrontal cortex then? But I think, I mean, if you go back and you think how many species actually stick around naturally long after their childbearing years are over, after the reproductive years are over, like menopause, from what I understand, menopause is not all that common in the animal world, right? So why would that happen? And so I saw Alison Gopnik said something about this. So I started to look into this about this idea that, you know, really, when you're older in most societies, your job is no longer to form new episodic memories. It's to pass on the memories that you already have, this knowledge about the world, or what we call semantic memory, to pass on that semantic memory to the younger generations, to pass on the culture. You know, even now in indigenous cultures, that's the role of the elders. They're respected. They're not seen as, you know, people who are past it and losing it. And I thought that was a very poignant thing that memory is doing what it's supposed to throughout these stages of life. So it is always optimal in a sense. Yeah. It's just optimal for that stage of life. Yeah. And for the ecology of the system. So you got, so I looked into this and it's like another species that has menopause is orcas. Orca pods are led by the grandmothers, right? So they're not the young adults, not the parents or whatever, the grandmothers. And so they're the ones that pass on the traditions to the, I guess, the younger generation of orcas. And if you, you know, if you look from what little I understand, different orca pods have different traditions. They hunt for different things. They have different play traditions. And uh, that's a culture, right? And so in social animals, mm -hmm. evolution, I think, is designing brains that are really around, you know, it's it's obviously optimized for the individual, but also for kin. Mm -hmm. And I think that the kin are part of this, like in, when they're a part of this intense social group, the brain development should parallel that, the nature of the ecology. Well, it's just fascinating to think of the individual orca or human throughout his life in stages, doing a kind of optimal wisdom development so in the early days, you don't even know what the goal is and you figure out the goal and you kind of optimize for that goal and you pursue that goal. And then all the wisdom you collect through that, then you share with the others in the system, with the other individuals. And as a, as a collective, then you kind of converge towards greater wisdom throughout the generation. So it, in that sense, it's optimal. Us humans and orcas got something going on.